Harry Floodbird Sr. was a lifelong resident of the Winchester area, born into a prominent but not wealthy family in 1887, dying in 1966. At the age of 15, he took over the publishing and editing of the family-owned Winchester Evening Star. Ten years later, he bought an apple orchard and eventually became a millionaire from that business. In 1922, he became chairman of the Virginia Democratic Party, the party that controlled Virginia, and thus the unquestioned political leader of Virginia. He went on to be governor and then United States senator and the political boss of Virginia until his fatal illness in 1965. You see him here with President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. In his final years, Harry Floodbird Sr. gained national notoriety by leading massive resistance to school desegregation in Virginia. By the way, we make, uh, we say his name carefully because uh, there are other Senator Byrds. Historians think that Harry Floodbird Sr. was very important. Brent Tarter, who wrote about Virginia history in general, called him the most influential white man in 20th century Virginia and said his dominant role in the dominant faction of the dominant party lasted longer and it was of more consequence to the people of the state than the political leadership role of any other Virginian ever. It's hard to beat that. Any other Virginian ever. Ronald Heineman, who was his biographer, said he was without a peer in building and maintaining a political organization that dominated the state for 40 years. Frankly, dominated might be putting it mildly. Bird wrote the script, created the set, chose the actors, and directed the play. For nearly half a century, Virginia was Harry Bird, or at least that part of Virginia that was politically active and economically well off. So historians found him quite important. Harry Flood Bird Sr. has a statue. You can see it here in Richmond, Virginia on Capitol Hill. The proprietor of this museum, Larry Lamar Yates, was putting a rubber-tipped arrow onto his foot in this picture to indicate that he shot himself in the foot with massive resistance. In addition to the statue, there's a major highway. Virginia Route 7 is Harry Flood Bird Senior Highway. For most of the way from Alexandria to just short of Winchester, where it becomes Berryville Pike after passing his former home of Rosemont. Now, Winchester is very serious about its history. Its self-description and its official strategic plan begins with its long history and the need for respecting and building on our heritage. In letters to the editor and the newspaper, we've seen a local nonprofit leader gushing, Winchester is so full of history, we're sitting on this history. People should come and visit us. A decade ago, a local official described Winchester as a place that successfully combines history, central old buildings and century old buildings and museums, with the vitality of an ideal downtown. Well, it's uh, it's a nice downtown. I will say that ideal is perhaps pushing it. Winchester has a lot of historic sites, Civil War battlefields, 
buildings used by Thomas Jackson, you may know him better by his thug name Stonewall, and George Washington, a large historic district, a statue of Admiral Richard E. Byrd, the Antarctic explorer, a high school that's on the National Register of Historic Places, and a Civil War museum in an old courthouse. Lots more. But the most important person who lived here, the guy that all those historians thought was just hard to beat, you know, there's not a trace of him. I write a lot of letters to the Winchester Star, and almost invariably they print them. This is the first one they absolutely refuse to print, or from that letter. I started out, having been familiar with Senator Byrd's damage to Virginia and the nation since my youth. Yeah, I, I never liked the guy. I was raised that way. I was curious to see how he was remembered here but I never would have predicted what I found, that he seems not to be remembered here at all. Not even remembered at all. I went on, Harry Flood Bird Sr., clearly the most historic, historically significant resident of this city, never ceased being active in this community from the age of 15 until his death. Yet there's not a statue or a public portrait, a building or thoroughfare named after him. And the city's institutions, even the Winchester Star itself, owned by his family, never publicly honor him and rarely even mention that he existed. How could this be in a history devoted city? There's not a statue, even a public portrait, not a building or thoroughfare named after him. Just this gigantic question mark, and even that I had to make up. So why? Why the silence? It really doesn't seem likely that Winchester's leaders just forgot to commemorate Byrd. Not for 50 years. I think they're too embarrassed to do so. Here's what I wrote in that letter, that rejected letter. Since I recognize Senator Byrd's invisibility here, I pondered on it. Senator Byrd's lifelong commitment to a racist system has largely been given the good old boy, that's the way things were back then, excuse. But aggressively taking on the Supreme Court to defend Jim Crow schools is harder to forget. That was massive resistance. Massive resistance still upsets people. Well, in 2016, 50 years after Harry Flood Bird Sr. died, Jordan Chapman, a high school student in Henrico County, realized that her school was named after the man that led massive resistance and shut down schools. She thought that was inappropriate. She started a campaign, got thousands of petition signatures, and ended up getting the school's name changed. Yep. Massive resistance still fires people up, even people who are born many years after it ended. Why does it still upset people? Well, first let's be clear about what massive resistance wasn't. It wasn't the kind of thing we often hear about, a gaffe, a scandal, an uncharacteristic whoopsie, by an elderly politician. Brown versus Board of Education, the 1954 Supreme Court decision, declared racial segregation of public schools unconstitutional. Massive resistance was the pro-segregation political reaction by Byrd and his entire political machine 
and many non-Virginia politicians to that decision. Massive resistance was a set of laws, and these laws, among other things, gave the Commonwealth of Virginia direct responsibility for the control of any school in Virginia. If children of both races are assigned or enrolled and enrolled by any school authorities, whether the school authorities were acting voluntarily or under compulsion by a court order, if any locality integrated a school, the state would seize the school and would shut it down. And that's what the Commonwealth of Virginia did. Starting less than 25 miles from Byrd's home in Warren County, Virginia closed schools as soon as the courts ordered them integrated. Private white schools were set up with state assistance. But almost as fast as the state shut the schools down, the courts ordered them open again. The bird machine could not win this game of judicial whack-a-mole because they were not in the right. And eventually, most Virginians decided they were tired of the game also. Massive resistance was a waste of Virginia's time and money. At the end of the process, Virginia had gotten nothing, had spent money on court cases, on closing and reopening schools, on private academies. Harry Floodbird Sr., who had been obeyed throughout Virginia for decades, turned out to be no leader at all when things got tough not even a successful segregationist leader. Many white students were put in all white private schools by their parents for years. Prince Edward County actually closed all of its public schools for five years. And of course, black students in most of these places went without schooling for anywhere from a few months to those five years in Prince Edward County. This damage might not have happened without Byrd's encouragement, but Byrd did nothing to help those who were harmed, black or white. He never took responsibility, as we're told conservatives do, as we're told people did back in the good old days. In May 1961, Harry Floodbird Sr. gave a speech in the U.S. Senate in which he blamed the NAACP for the problems in Prince Edward County. He said that the efforts to set up privately funded schools for black children, in other words, to continue segregation, but on a private basis, were the way to go. And he criticized the NAACP for not going along. The same month, bird machine politician Albertus Harrison praised massive resistance. He said that it helped Virginia to fight off the first stages of integration. The Lynchburg News, and we're not talking about a radical paper here, responded quickly that Virginia's ill-fated venture cost this state dearly in industrial development and in the education of 12,000 school children who were, for a time, locked out of their classes. It just got uglier. For Virginia, a state that badly wanted the rest of the nation to see it as a great place to visit, the birthplace of U.S. democracy, it was important to put massive resistance behind them. And when Harry Flood Byrd Sr. died in 1966 and several of his Byrd machine leaders were defeated for re-election, the opportunity arose to do so. But putting it behind us 
isn't enough. Slowly around Virginia, it's become possible to discuss Harry Flood Bird Sr. again, to recognize the harm that he did, and also to see that massive resistance was not everything that he did. But here in the Winchester area, in the places that knew him best, among the people that he knew best, the silence continues. <laughs>